So I kind of want to go back to something that um, Dr. Nixon mentioned earlier. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before, Kari, but this idea that in modern times, we feel like medicine can fix almost anything. And we have vaccines and we have antibiotics and things that were, you know, deadly 200 years ago now are, are treatable. And um, I think it's interesting to, in this time of COVID where people are suddenly maybe understand that maybe everything can't be fixed or can't be cured um, quickly. And so I'd like to ask you, you know, maybe what briefly share some lessons that you think we've learned through COVID that could help um, communicating about uh, antimicrobial resistance. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Just, just kind of what we've learned in our communication um, aspects with COVID uh, that we can maybe apply to, to AMR or to other topics as well. Right. So I may end up sounding like I'm contradicting myself a little bit, but yes, anytime we talk about public health recommendations, we're talking about um, individual liberties versus the common good. But one thing I've seen during COVID, and I think it applies to AMR a lot, actually, and, and also people's distrust of science and skepticism, is that we're actually first talking about asking people to substitute a collective reality for their personally experienced reality of their body. So when we have, for instance, with COVID, and this actually applies to um, Mary Mallon being a healthy carrier of typhoid fever, we're asking people to mask up who might not feel sick. And we're asking them to believe science's collective reality that you might be sick even if you don't feel sick. And again, I think it would serve us well to understand that that's a huge ask. Um, there's pretty much nothing more personal than our own physical experience of our bodies. And we're asking people to say like, no, 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 disregard that and believe these people over here. That's a huge ask. Um, and I think it applies to AMR in the sense that people don't really feel when they've taken an antibiotic, perhaps needlessly in a clinical setting, they don't feel any sensation that that has contributed to a greater global problem. Um, this applies to uh, carbon emissions, recycling. On our individual level, we may not feel these macroscopic changes in the aggregate. And this is something that, um, Amy, you and I have worked on in our work with AMR and trying to communicate AMR. Uh, we've drawn from studies in the, the science of communicating science. And one thing we've learned is that scale is really important. Um, as humans, we tend to only really be able to imagine things on a human scale. Imagining very, very microscopic changes is basically impossible for us to perceive in our minds. You know, even if we see them on a microscope, it's hard to really transfer that or extrapolate that to microscopic changes in our body. And I think the same goes for very, very big global changes. We don't perceive that very well. Um, so one thing we've talked about a lot and seen in science communication studies is human scaling and the use of narrative to be able to scale very big or very large problems through metaphor or parallel or analog to something that might make sense for people. All right, thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Dr. Matthesi, I want to come back to you. Um, kind of change uh, direction here just a little bit, but you've done quite a bit of research on methods of communicating science. And so, um, one of the things we've talked about is marketing science. And, and I'm interested in kind of your perspective on some basic uh, concepts related to marketing science and how we can. Um, do that better with our um, individual research areas and, and areas of interest. Yeah, great. So I think the important thing to, to first start with is this idea that uh, the world that we all live in isn't a laboratory or it isn't a classroom. It's, it's in fact a marketplace. We are constantly competing uh, with information. Um, we are, as a society, just inundated. Um, and, and so recognizing that we get our information from so many sources and we have all these other cues that come into place 
seen um, how many likes there are on a story or how many retweets a post has gotten. And it's hard to ignore those contextual cues. Um, and so it's important to notice that when we are in this busy space, we're competing for people's attention. Um, and I saw that there was a question from Carol Brown about uh, wanting to discuss uh, sensationalized facts. And this really falls into this discussion right here um, because we do see those stories that have become sensationalized as a way to grab people's attention. And they're really pretty successful because they're selling that story. Um, it may not be an accurate story. And that uh, again, brings us back to science communication and, and literacy. Um, but, but being educated about this, this marketing is, is important. Um, also contributing to that is this kind of journalistic norm of a balanced media story, uh, where, where journalists tend to give, um, a voice to both sides of an issue, uh, even if they aren't equal. So you may have, you know, 99% of scientists saying one thing, you know, oftentimes a story will give voice to that, that other 1%, um, which can really be difficult uh, and obscure scientific findings uh, for people who maybe aren't as well versed in kind of picking through that noise. Um, and so then we have to deal with things like misinformation and, and false news. And we see this every day in COVID communication. Um, and both COVID and AMR information are really complex and, and they can change very quickly. And so it's hard to regulate um, that information. And that's why the science communication is so critical. Okay, so, so when we're continuing on in this kind of conversation, it's important to know that science doesn't have to be boring or, or dispassionate. Um, you know, there's this kind of background in, in thinking that to, to make sound decisions, we're supposed to leave emotion out of it, but actually good decisions incorporate both reason and emotion. Um, so you can think about the example of Phineas Gage that people, people talk about all the time the railroad foreman who had the iron pole go through his head and badly damaged his, his brain. Um, and they found that he could still do a lot of functioning things, um, but when he had to interact with people, he just couldn't do it. This, this connection between emotion and reasoning is, is really essential. Um, so I find emotions really fascinating in communication, and I've looked at quite a few uh, emotions and how they influence our processing of information. Um, specifically, I've looked at disgust and anger. So I worked on a project with the American Society for Microbiology, uh, where we looked at the influence of disgust on perceptions of risk related to modifying microbiomes, um, specifically looking at fecal transplants. Uh, so the issue of disgust is kind of commonplace there. Um, and we kind of found that this explicitly disgusting commentary really increased perceptions of risk, that emotion had a profound impact on individuals. Um, and then I also find anger to be a really fascinating emotion. Um, we talk a lot about with science, um, you know, fear, uh, which is kind of a low activation emotion. It tends to be that when we feel fearful, we may be shut down, or when we feel happy, we're maybe not motivated to, to, to take action. But anger is actually a, a really high activation emotion. When we feel angry, we want to do something, we want to take action. Um, that being said, it's kind of inconsistent with uh, how it influences our thought process. Um, so sometimes anger has been found to have individuals respond very quickly without uh, much thought. Um, or to really sit and contemplate, kind of stew in our anger to make decisions. Um, so I, I really do think that emotion and, and rationale uh, really go hand in hand when it comes to strategically communicating efforts with, with the general public. Um, and then I've also done a fair amount of research with humor. Um, and, you know, why? Uh, anecdotally, there is a lot of science humor out there. You wouldn't think so, but, but there is. On, on Twitter, I encourage you to go check out the hashtag OverlyHonestMethods. There are some really hilarious posts. Um, 
But basically, we're starting to see scientists engage more with individuals and using humor. Um, and, and it's become this kind of recommendation, but which traditionally was not necessarily what scientists were told. You know, there's kind of this tradition of, of um, not, you know, influencing your, your research with something uh, such as humor. Um, but this has kind of become a, a recent phenomenon, but we have very little empirical research about if scientists using humor actually works with connecting with the general public. Um, so I've, I've been doing research with a group where we first were, um, we had two key goals. So the first was to really look at uh, social media environments and see are scientists using humor? And if so, what kind of humor are they using? And, and how successful is it? Uh, so we did a rather large project where we were on both Twitter and Instagram and we coded quite a few uh, posts um, and basically found that there's a lot of science related humor on Twitter and Instagram. Um, we found uh, quite a few posts using wordplay, satire, anthropomorphism, parody. So you can see some of the examples on the screen right now. Those are some of the better ones. Trust me, there were some very, very bad examples um, that we had to weed through. Uh, but basically, we found that different types of humor engaged people in different ways. So on Twitter, we found that the presence of satire uh, predicted uh, positive increases in likes and retweets. Um, meanwhile, wordplay positively predicted comments on posts. And anthropomorphism actually negatively predicted comments. So people, that I guess, didn't like the cute cat in the middle there. Um, so then we went on and we decided we wanted to test these. So we conducted an experimental survey where we embedded a Twitter post manipulation that looked at um, wordplay, anthropomorphism, and uh, no humor. Um, and we did that because satire is a little more nuanced and it can be kind of difficult to manipulate. Um, but basically, we found that uh, these humorous conditions actually led people to engage more with the Twitter posts. Um, they were more likely to report hypothetical liking, retweeting, sharing of the posts, and they actually could go in and comment on the post like they maybe would on, on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, so this research shows that actually science communicators crafting these strategic methods or messages can really benefit from using types of humor to engage with audiences. Maybe it's a good time to jump in. We got a couple questions from audience members about how to deal with topics that have become politicized or when pol politicians are promoting distrust. Um, sounds like humor would be a good way to address that, but do you guys have any other um, ways to kind of defuse that situation? Yeah, humor um, can also, be, oh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say humor can be can be great, um, but knowing your audience, you know, that could backfire pretty quickly. Um, I think the number one thing with with science deniers is is to ask them where they're getting their information. I mean, I teach a, a communication methods course, and one of the key takeaways that I want my students to understand is knowing the source of your information and looking to see where that information came from. How many, um, you know, studies are cited in that article? Um, is it just one person that is saying this? Um, I was going to save this for when we go through tips, but I. Um... I think Deborah Saylor asked a great question about how to change communication strategies when a topic becomes politicized. And this was a major source of our literature review on an article um, Amy and I have been working on about how to communicate about AMR. And not only does narrative, using narrative to sort of simulate outcomes for an audience and scaling matter, but they also found that um, non-agentive language matters. So not making people feel like we're pointing a finger at them. And I think I've seen that in the mask debates. People feel like we're saying they're a bad person. Mary Mallon felt that way. Uh, people asked to wash their hands and the obstetrics hospitals felt that they were being incriminated. Um, but another finding from a study that I really liked showed that 
In fact, the greater scientific literacy of a, a reader of a scientific study, the more likely when dealing with a politicized issue, the more likely that person was to revert to whatever belief they had already had. Um, and so scientific literacy isn't the full equation. We are social people and when we're confronted with distressing information that makes us feel uncertain about the world, we're going to retreat to what makes us feel safe and like things are predictable and that's our social group. So let's say that you're very, very pro-life and you read some studies um, promoting pro-choice information scientifically or statistically, the more science literate you are, the more you're actually going to revert to your in-group thinking of your social group that's pro-life. And this um, is the most important thing I've learned about politicized issues in particular.